My name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. My name is Josh Zinn. I'm the co-director at NEDAP, which is a New York City-based organization that fights for financial justice in low-income communities. Great. Um, so I was actually referred to you by Doug Henwood. Um, his question, the question that he had at the time is, why isn't there an Occupy movement in, say, um, South Jamaica, Queens? And he specifically referenced the fact that the people in those neighborhoods, South Jamaica, Queens being one of them, um, other parts of Brooklyn, and your organization has actually done maps of this, but uh, were drawn in by um, these, you know, encouraged to take these home equity loans that then later blew up on them. And they're having terrible foreclosure crises in these neighborhoods. So maybe if you can tell us a little bit about that and what your organization does with respect to those things. Sure. Yeah. Um, un unfortunately, going, going way back, um, neighborhoods of communities of color in New York City and around the country were really targeted for abusive, high cost loans. Um, it, it really goes back to sort of in the 90s, Wall Street figured out how to make a lot of money from bundling and packaging and selling off to investors um, pack, uh, securities that were based on high cost mortgages. And the way they did it is they uh, they got mortgage lenders that were in the communities to go out with mortgage brokers and just go door to door and really saturate communities. And um, again, these are communities that were redlined by mainstream banks, where the mainstream banks for many, many years, the big banks, they weren't lending in communities of color. They weren't making fair mortgage credit available. Um, they were discriminating based on race, where they were literally drawing red lines around communities and not doing lending there. So there's, there's this big hole, this big void. Um, and into the void came these abusive lenders who were peddling high cost credit, credit that was uh, really had very, very high um, points and fees and interest rates um, where they were really gouging people. Um, and many of the loans that they were pushing on people were unaffordable from their beginning, not sound mortgage loans. Um, and the way they were making money is they were selling them off. They were turning around and they were selling them off to Wall Street. What Wall Street was doing is they were, they were basically, they were sort of putting lipstick on a pig. Um, they were taking these mortgages, they were taking hundreds of millions of dollars worth of these mortgages and they would bundle them together in, the, in what they called securitization trusts. They would bundle all these mortgages together and then they would chop them up into pieces and they would sell those pieces off to investors like pension funds, like state investment funds. And they would get these credit rating agencies to rate them at what they called AAA. Basically, a lot of them were junk loans, um, but they were paying these credit rating agencies that were making money from the investment banks to rate them as AAA. And then they would peddle them off to investors as AAA securities, top rated securities. And um, everybody was making money. This was Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers and Morgan Stanley and all the big investment banks. Um, and because they could sell these loans to investors, they were making a killing. And it really didn't matter what the quality of the loans were. They, you know, they would sort of, we called it mortgage laundering. They would put uh, all these crappy mortgages in at one end and then by through paying off credit rating agencies and bond and what they called bond insurers, they would spit them out the other end as, as, as mortgage-backed securities and everybody wanted to buy them. The investment banks, they knew what they were selling, um, junk, but they were peddling these off as, as good paper. So the upshot of it all was there were all these mortgage lenders who were running around in, in low-income communities and communities of color peddling crap, peddling mortgages that were unaffordable that had these really high rates and fees and it led to very very high rates of foreclosure um, and you mentioned Jamaica Queens. Jamaica Queens was sort of um, ground zero for this type of lending. It was a community where that it was a, a working class African American community. Many people bought their homes uh, back in the 60s cheaply and had paid off their debt. Um, they were poor. They were living on social security or pension uh, and, um, and, and the equity in their homes was really the, you know, their, their, all of their family wealth. Uh, and these brokers and lenders were coming in and literally 
uh, talking people into mortgages. They would get their foot in the door and they'd say, oh, we're going to fix up your house. We can do this for you. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. They took all their debt, all their medical debt. They would pile them into these loans uh, and then they would get people to the table. Uh, you know, and, and they would say, don't worry about it, we'll take care of you, you don't need a lawyer. And so, you know, you would get this 70-year-old uh, widow coming in the door, many of them were African-American homeowners, and would, were come, in, would come in and, uh, you know, it would, they'd sit down and then there would be these suits around the table that would give them a stack of papers, you know, 50 pieces of paper, sign here, sign here, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. People were getting into loans that were really unaffordable from their beginning, and it led to very, very high rates of foreclosure and displacement. And this went on for many, many years. What, uh, what Wall Street was doing, they were making so much money off these types of loans that they were really inventing products and aggressively pushing products that they knew were crap, um, but which made them a lot of money. So they were pushing these no income, no asset mortgages, they call them Nina loans. Basically, these were loans where you didn't even have to uh, establish how much uh, money you made. Usually you go in to get a mortgage and you have to show proof of your income. Here you didn't have to do it. Or you could just state it and you didn't have to show proof. And so mortgage brokers and lenders, the, the unscrupulous, the dirty ones, they were just going in and falsifying all of this information and getting low income people into uh, unaffordable loans. And then Wall Street was spitting them out the other end and selling them off to investors as AAA paper. And, um, and, and they, you know, this just went on and on and on, and they were making so much money head over heels. Um, a lot of us who were working on the ground at the time, you know, in the, in the uh, late 90s and going through the next decade, they, we knew what was going on, and we were raising these issues with the Federal Reserve and with, the, with all the federal regulators. We were raising these issues with the banks. The banks would say, oh, this is just a few bad apples. This is not going on. You know, you're just talking about a few bad players. They, were, they knew very well what was going on, Chase and City and Bank of America and all these guys, um, but they were, uh, you know, they were claiming that they were doing good things for communities, providing mortgage credit, when in fact they were making a killing, really gouging communities. And the regulators, they didn't want to listen. They were really sort of uh, influenced by Alan Greenspan, who was the head of the Fed at the time. And he was really intoxicated by all this, uh, you know, this, this, this fast credit that was around. Uh, and he has all this faith in, in, the, in the market to fix itself, you know, and he would say, well, the, you know, the market, if there's a problem, the market will correct itself. And this is sort of the attitude that regulators took. But the problem with these crappy mortgages, these, these subprime, these abusive mortgages is the market really wasn't functioning there at all, um, you know. The market, if you're, if you're selling milk, if you're a milk seller and you sell sour milk, nobody's going to buy it. Um, and, and so the market fixes itself. You have to sell fresh milk. Um, but with these mortgages, the, actually the, the worse the mortgages were, the crappier they were, the more money you made. Um, and so the market was completely warped. There was a perverse incentive really for uh, brokers and lenders to make loans that were completely unaffordable because the more they made, the more they... They, the more papers they falsified and the more mortgages they made to people in the street, the more money they made. And so the system really broke down and the, and the regulators, uh, especially at the federal level, completely dropped the ball. Um, they, really, uh, di they really did nothing. They sat by despite getting, they, you know, they had all sorts of information about what was going on on the ground. Um, and they were so captured by the big banks and the big investment banks that they did nothing until the whole economy crashed. So it was really frustrating for those of us who saw this coming for years to see the whole, to see this house of cards collapse. And of course, it's spread out through the whole economy. It's been a disaster. Right. And, and you had a sense even at the time that this was systemic, that there was a possibility of systemic risk with this. Yeah. I mean, we, obviously nobody knew how bad the systemic risk was, but, right. uh, but we, we knew it was systemic because we knew that, uh, um, you know, you went out to neighborhoods like Jamaica or the Bed-Stuy and there were whole blocks that were decimated by these mortgages. And one thing I didn't mention is the lenders and the brokers, they wouldn't just go after somebody once. When somebody fell behind, they would talk them into a refinance and these were called loan flips and they would flip people over and over and over again. And if you go talk to families out there in those neighborhoods or if you look at the deed records, you can see like a litany of these bad lenders. Um, doing loans over and over and over again. Uh, and, and so you could really, there was a huge volume 
of these loans being made. And of course, the big banks, they got into the business, they started buying up these predatory lenders. City Financial, uh, City Group bought up a predatory lender called the Associates, and Chase bought up a predatory lender, and then Bank of America bought up Countrywide, which is one of the worst, right. the infamous ones. Uh, and, um, and, and so there was such a huge volume of these loans being made, and, and it, was, it, it was a business in the trillions. And this was being, these, these securities were being sold to pension funds and to state investment funds. This was people's retirement, working people's retirement. This was the money that right. states... Right, Iceland, the country of Iceland, I think, pretty much went down because of it. Iceland went down. I read there was some story about a little town in Sweden that had put all its money into, into mortgage-backed securities. But, you know, the states were putting their money in, money they used to, to you know, to, to run their states. And so you could see, you right. know, we knew course, these were... And of course, what's critical with that was this AAA rating, because a lot of these pensions or municipalities have rules that they can only that they can only invest this money in the most uh, safe investments. So the fact that they were able to convince—I don't know if that's the right word—the credit agencies to put AAA ratings, you know, like you said, putting lipstick on a pig on these things that were they had to have known were bad loans um, yeah that's so central to the whole thing it really is because exactly as you say that you know the big pension funds and mutual funds are required by law to invest in AAA rated paper now this the, the the junk that went in at one end these bad mortgages they were anything but AAA they were they were you know really a lot of them were unaffordable they're really bad mortgages and then the investment banks that are putting them together, they knew it. There's ample evidence that they knew what was what was going into these securitizations. You know, they have they hire these firms out to sort of take a look at a sample. And 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 the samples were coming back just riddled with with illegalities and abuses and unaffordable loans. And they and instead of taking a look at a larger sample, they turned around to these credit rating agencies and they told them the paper was fine. We were discussing I guess a story that you guys have been watching for, you know, well over a decade now that we all had unfold and were kind of told nobody could have seen this coming and how could we have known what was happening, um, which was that these mortgage companies, predatory lenders um, were making loans that they knew were bad loans and it didn't in fact matter that they were bad loans, as you said in in ways the worse the better um and then they could package them up and sell them off and these were being sold uh these were being given triple a ratings by credit uh ratings agencies that were being paid by the lenders the ratings agencies were and then were being sold to pension funds and municipalities and iceland and all kinds of places who then um when the housing and, and, it, and it sounds like you guys were seeing the effects of this a long time back. So there were foreclosures that were happening a long time back, even before the housing market went down. Or did it really? Was there a noticeable difference when the housing? You know, because as long as housing prices were going up, you could do as you were talking about before these kind of loan flips, right? As long as people were getting increased equity in their homes. But then once the housing bubble burst, it was kind of the game was over. There was no equity there. There was nothing. Yeah, so it was, uh, that's exactly right. And I mean, just going back for a moment to the credit rating agencies, that AAA rating that you mentioned, that was really the key to all of it. And that that's what allowed uh, the investment banks by law to peddle these securities to, to pension funds, to state investment funds, you know, and, people's retirement money and, 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 you know, money states have uh, to, you know, to spend on services um, would go into these securities. And, and even though they were junk coming in one end, they got the credit rating agencies to rate them AAA rated. And they knew, the investment banks knew very well because they had, had to have, they had companies actually take samples of these loans and they had a lot of evidence that, that there was really crap in there, that there was really these mortgages, many were unaffordable and they violated the law. Um, but but nevertheless, the credit rating agencies would spit them out AAA or good portions of them. And the credit rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, Standard & Poor's, they got paid by the investment banks that were doing the deals. And if they didn't rate a deal the way the investment bank wanted to, well, that, that investment bank would then go to the next credit rating agency. So they had really this 
incentive to rate them AAA when they were anything but. And that was really the key to the whole thing. That that really um, set up the whole fraud because they were able to, you know, take garbage in, but instead of garbage going out, they were they were spitting out these AAA rated securities. It, it, it was a it was a complete mess. And, and and as you said before, there was just this there was this frenzy um, because there was so much money to be made. There was this frenzy. Um, by Wall Street to feed this this securitization machine to feed this machine. So they were really trying to get lenders to make any mortgages they could to you know to to feed the fire. Um, right. And so these these lenders were flipping loans. They were repeatedly refinancing people. Like the adjustable rate mortgages that you you know that you uh, hear about it. That, you know they they're set up to they had one initial or they had one initial rate and then after two years the rate would go up. Now, a lot of these were unaffordable from the beginning, but um, you know, but some the, the payment would go up by hundreds of dollars after two years. They weren't underwritten by these banks to be affordable at all. They were underwritten to blow up in two years. And the game was, well, and blow up in two years, and then the borrower has to refinance, and they would come back and they would solicit refinance. So this, this product was actually designed to feed to you know to get people to refinance repeatedly. Right. And there were and these loans that were out there and, and as long as people had equity in their homes as long as they could keep refinancing they could st- keep feeding the beast but so as housing prices started to fall in 2006 people ran out of equity to do these refinance loans and 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 these adjustable rate mortgages started defaulting people started falling behind and going into foreclosure on these and that's when these securitization trusts just fell apart it, it then sort of the, you know the the, the, the truth was out and it was, uh, you know, revealed that they were just really house of cards and it, and it crumbled. And, you know, right. the effects reverberated everywhere. It, I right. mean, it, you asked earlier, could we predict it? We could see the size of it. But what nobody knew at the time was that, you know, not only were they packed, were they sell the, you know, the big banks selling off these, um, these securities, but then they were, they were also taking the pieces of these securities and they were repackaging them. Um, it, it, it was amazing. They would, you know, the AAA paper they would sell off, and then there were other slices they would sell off to hedge funds and other investors. Right. But they would take some of these these bad slices. They were called B and C slices, and they would all put them back into another bundle. They called these uh, collateralized debt obligations, and they would repackage them and they would reslice them, and then they would sell off as AAA pieces of that. And so they kept there were. They, you know, so one mortgage was repackaged in so many different ways, um, and, and the effects were really, really vast. They also had insurance on these mortgages. It was basically called credit default swaps, where they would sell off. Um, you know, when they sold a package of mortgage-backed securities, somebody else would buy insurance uh, if these securities failed, and these were called credit default swaps. But really, they were just insurance. But they wrote much more insurance than actually the value of the mortgage securities that were out there. This is what happened to AIG. You know, they they had trillions of insurance. Uh, you know, on on these mortgage-backed securities, and AIG had a, a huge amount, many you know, hundreds of billions. And when the market went belly up, AIG couldn't make good on those bets because they had written a lot more insurance than actually they could cover. Um, and so that's why we, the taxpayers, had to bail them out to the tune of 175 billion dollars. Their their executives have made made you know many millions in bonuses they got paid off so yeah this is you know the first thing i remember hearing you know and just listening to you describe it all the first thing i remember hearing that made me very suspicious was this claim that this was all far too complex for anybody to understand right that these these deals you know there's only a couple you know, people in the world who can understand them, but it's, it doesn't sound like it's actually that complicated. I mean, I think that, I think that the credit agencies were very aware that the, you know, underlying deals were garbage, um, but were being paid as you said. And, and there, because there's a system of competition, because there's three of them, they could go from one to the next. And part of their cover is to say that these were very complex and nobody really understood them. But I think it sounds like there were probably people, probably the people intimately involved, as you said, they were designed to have to, to blow up. They were designed to have to refinance, which 
obviously was going to work as long as the housing market was going up, right? As long as there's increased equity and you could keep flipping these mortgages. But as soon as it came to an end, then there had to be people who were involved, who knew that there was systemic risk. You, you know, as you said, you could see that there was, you know, maybe it was even bigger than you thought, but you guys could see that, that this was a house of cards that was going to come down and you were warning people. Um, but everybody was making money and the housing market was going up. And, you know, I mean, in one sense, I understand. And like you said, there's these different tiers. And so that's the idea of why you can give a AAA rating is because, well, they're going to get paid first. So really, the whole thing would have to collapse in order for the first tier not to get paid. Right. Is that that yeah, was kind of the idea of the tiers, the tier system. But on the other hand, you know, why they thought you could you know, these, these loans that were based that, as you said, were not designed to, um, you know, they were designed to default in essence. And so then when, you know, there had to be people who are aware. So, you know, one of the questions I have is, do you think that there's criminal, um, activity? Should there have been some kind of crim investigation? Should there have been criminal prosecutions? Was there fraud? Um, have you guys pushed for that at all, or are you aware of any of that? Because there, there was none, basically. Right? The, the answer to that is a resounding yes. Uh, there was an enormous amount of criminal fraud. This was the biggest crime, at least financially, ever perpetrated on the American people. Um, there was, there, you know, there's, this is a huge criminal fraud. Um, now. The, I, and I and I entirely agree that these uh, that you know these players knew what was going on. In fact, Goldman Sachs um, was was peddling on. They they were at the same time they were market, marketing these uh, mortgage-backed securities to investors. They were trying to get rid of all of their holdings because they knew it was junk. Um, right. And the credit rating agencies, these guys knew. It, Everybody knew there was ample warning on the ground. This, you know, this was not a, 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 the, these were not some unsuspecting innocent players who thought they were dealing in legitimate mortgages, and um, and, and the level of criminal, the level of, of fraud is very high. And you know, one thing that's uh, that's pretty alarming, and I think you're hearing this a lot, and and maybe this is, I think, one of the themes in the Occupy Wall Street movement is where's the accountability? Uh, you know, these guys. These guys ripped off the American public. They ripped off investors. They ripped off homeowners, and they brought down the economy. They brought down the economy of the world, and they they crashed our economy. And you know, look at the situation we're in. And where's the accountability? There's no, you know, there there have not been any uh, criminal prosecutions of note. There haven't really been any even civil prosecutions of note. And I think that people are. Outraged. I think this is one unifying tie of the Occupy Wall Street movement, and it goes across, um, you know, political stripes. Right. People know that the banks took advantage, and the investment banks, and and and, and people want to know when are they going to be held accountable? Instead of going to jail, these guys are getting, you know, still getting record bonuses, and and it's it's fundamentally unfair. Um, so yeah, so that is a big question. When is there going to be some accountability? The New York Attorney General. Uh, Eric Schneiderman has, has, is, is, has launched a big investigation into some of these practices of, of, of putting together these mortgage-backed securities, and we're very hopeful that something will lead to that. But he's under a lot of pressure to, to settle with the right. banks, and we'll see what happens. I think he's one of our last hopes. To, yeah, I mean, know, wasn't he was like the, whole, the sole holdout on the 50-state settlement, right? Yeah, I think there were a few holdouts, but there weren't okay. many. And uh, right. he was the big one, and he's facing a lot of pressure as a result. The administration is trying to, you know, is, is trying to settle this. And you know, we, I think everybody is, is wants to see people held accountable, uh, and 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 that's not happening. You know, we it, there there was this great moment, um, or I I don't want to say a great moment. There was an interesting moment when all of the banks had to be bailed out. Um, when we thought, you know what, maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's going to be some quid pro quo here. Maybe um, there's going to be some accountability. Maybe there's going to be some trade-off. Maybe the banks are going to have to actually do something in the public interest instead of sucking the wealth out of the public. Um, 
And that moment was lost. And, um, and you know, when the financial reform bill was passed last year, Dodd-Frank, I mean, there's some good pieces in there, but the banks, they, they've lobbied so hard against it and they tried to gut every meaningful provision in that bill and they continue to. There's all these regulations being written and it'll sort of flesh out what's there and they're fighting to gut every piece of it. They're as strong as ever. They're injecting money into the political system. They're fighting reform. Um, they haven't been chastened at all. Um, they're back stronger than ever. And that moment um, that we had to, to, you know, to, to at least get some trade-offs in exchange for these massive bailouts, it was lost. And the banks are, the, you know, the big banks are, are the most subsidized industry out there. Um, maybe big agriculture is, you know, it, it, it competes with them, although that's not the same uh, amount of money we're talking about. <clears throat> They're subsidized in so many ways by the public. Our bailouts of Chase and, and Citibank and Wells Fargo and Bank of America, you, you know, this notion that they're too big to fail, what that means is they can get great terms. Everybody knows they're going to be bailed out. There's no risk in doing business with those banks, and that's a huge competitive advantage to them. They get trillions of money from the federal, uh, of dollars of money from the Federal Reserve at virtually 0% interest that they can turn around and make money off. They get huge advantages, huge subsidies from taxpayers, and they need to give back in return. The banks are like, especially the way that we subsidize them, they're, you know, they, they, they get deposit insurance, they get all these subsidies. They're, they, they're, they should be a public utility that serves the economy. Instead, all that they're doing these days is sucking uh, the blood out of the economy. They're not serving the economy, they're draining the economy. And there has to be accountability here. It's a really fundamental problem. And, you know, one of the things that, um, I really like in the Occupy Wall Street movement, again, you know, not everybody's focused on, you know, this law or that law or, you know, the transaction tax or people are really looking at much more broadly at the fundamental inequities here. You know, why the, why the wealthy have, you know, are, are, are getting richer and richer and richer uh, and why, why the poor and the, and the working class and the middle class are, are getting screwed and, and, and people are looking at these really fundamental issues. And, and bank accountability is one of those fundamental issues. They blew up the economy. They, you know, they, they, they destroyed communities around the country. And instead of being accountable and instead of trying to be, you know, instead of being part of the solution, they're continuing to, to, to bilk everybody. Yeah, I, I do agree with you that one of the big underlying, um, I guess, you know, underlying principles behind this movement is the idea that there was no accountability, um, you know, that there, and, you know, Glenn Greenwald actually, you know, just wrote a book about it and is out talking about it. Um, you know, this idea that there's two sets of rules, you know, there's the rules for the rich and powerful, and there's the rules for everybody else. And the fact that there were no criminal prosecutions, that there was no you know, that there's this huge pressure for the states to, you know, reach the settlement with the banks that appears to be woefully inadequate compared to um, the fraud that obviously occurred. And, and we won't even, and that doesn't even really talk about the damage that occurred. Like you said, they crashed the world economy. There was, you know, uh, Erin Burnett has this new show on CNN, and I don't know if you saw it. She did this, her very first show, she does this segment criticizing the Occupy Wall Street movement. And she goes and talks to somebody and says, well, you know, the banks paid back the bailout money. You know, the, the American people made money off of the bailouts. But, I mean, they crashed the world economy. Even if they had paid back, and, and I don't think that seems, it doesn't appear that that's even true because she didn't count, of course, the money that went to Goldman Sachs through AIG and various portions of bailout funds that haven't been paid back. But it did trillions of dollars of damage. I mean, we're not just just the individual bailout funds is the tip of that's just the money that we had to pay to recapitalize them. You know, it does nothing for all of this massive overhang of debt that is now holding back our economy, that is throwing millions of people out of their homes every day. Um, the amount of damage that was caused by what appears to have been massive fraud. 
Um, and we've had no criminal prosecutions. We've had no real legislation to deal with this. It's absolutely unbelievable. Um, and, and like you say, now, you know, they were able to, you know, take bailout money and use it to lobby for, you know, no regulation, you know, no changes that would in any meaningfully, any meaningful way, um, challenge what they're, what they're doing. So it's absolutely unbelievable. Um, you know, and there yeah, are some I people, say, I mean, you what? hit on, a, a, you know, one point that you said, I think is a really important one, which is, you know, this notion they paid back the bailout money. Um, I, first of all, they're subsidized in so many ways by taxpayers. And second of all, as you said, they, they destroyed people's lives. They destroyed communities, right? So now they're back on their feet, but the rest of the country's not. And that's fundamentally unfair. And unfortunately, our politics is captured by the banks in both parties. Um, and we're not making headway and holding them accountable. Right. So, and so what are you guys, you know, are you, what are, I don't know what your organization is doing. Um, you know, there are some organizations who are helping people in foreclosure, who are doing some kind of creative things to help people in foreclosure. Are you guys involved with any of that? Yeah, we, we, um, we run a, a foreclosure prevention loan fund and we work with a bunch of counseling groups and, and, um, and legal services programs that are helping homeowners on the ground. So we make loans to people, to, to, to families to prevent foreclosure. And we're, you know, we're working on, on policy on a number of levels at, at, at the state level to try and create a system in the courts that's fair for homeowners where there's um, where homeowners can go to court and 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 um, and get a fair hearing on a loan modification to try and restructure their loan to make it affordable. So we have a network here in New York where we're trying to uh, you know we're trying to get uh, prevent foreclosures on the ground. Um, but we're also working with groups around the state, the city, and the state, and groups nationally to hold the servicers accountable. Uh, that you know the, the the biggest servicers in the country are the big banks. Chase and Bank of America and Wells Fargo and City, those are the four biggest, and and they're not doing, you know, they, again this goes back to the theme of banks not being accountable for the damage they've they've caused um, in the mortgage realm. They're not, you know, they're the ones that are, can that are making the decisions on whether to foreclose or whether to restructure a loan, and they're not they're not doing their job. They're not restructuring loans for homeowners who really should qualify for a modification. And they're throwing huge numbers of people into foreclosure who otherwise could um, would, would be able to stay in their home. So we're working broadly with groups around the country to hold them accountable. And frankly, it's difficult because there still is a lack of regulatory accountability. Um, but we're hoping that some of the uh, work that the AGs are doing, particularly the New York AG, will push them um, to more broadly write down principle to reduce some of these mortgages to the to the value of the homes. Um, we're also hoping that the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is this federal bureau that was set up to look after uh, communities and people uh, in the financial system, that you know one of uh, one of the things that they're overseeing is the mortgage business, and we're we're hoping that they're able. This was, I, I should say, one of the few really bright uh, stories to come out of the Dodd Frank bill. This agency potentially could could do a lot of good, and we're waiting to see if they're able to really assert their authority over the or, over the mortgage business and 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 push servicers to to you know to do, to do modifications where they should um, so there, there's a lot of moving pieces at the at the at the federal level just around foreclosures you know one thing that's a shame is the um, you know that one thing that would have made a lot of difference is some changes to the bankruptcy laws uh, that would allow bankruptcy courts to write down these mortgages to the value of the homes. As you mentioned this earlier, there's, you know, there's, there's millions of homeowners around the country, many millions who, who owe far more than their property's worth. And it, it, it's, it's creating a real problem in the housing market. Um, people can't sell their home. Uh, people can't move. There's no mobility, even though there aren't jobs. People can't move to get a job because they can't sell their home. And, and so that people are stuck. People don't have money to spend because they're paying far more for their mortgage than they should be. Um, and and these bankruptcy rules would have allowed bankruptcy courts to to what's called cram down or to push down the value of the mortgage to the value of the home. And this would have allowed people to really reset uh, their debt uh, and get a fresh start and pay on a fair mortgage. Uh, and the banks lobbied hard against this. They killed it. 
The Obama administration, which had stated it was a priority, actually um, you know, didn't follow through or, or push hard for it. And then when the banks lashed out, Bank of America and Chase especially, um, it was killed. And that would have really fundamentally uh, 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 helped the situation. So there's, you know, we're stuck with a bunch of half measures right now. Um, and, and we're hopeful through some of these attorney general actions that we'll get some relief. But Right. Uh, yeah. And, and just, to, just to back up and provide just a little bit of context, this, you know, there's some people are underwater is the term that's usually used is, you know, meaning that their house, they owe more than their house is worth. And so the bankruptcy courts are not allowed to reduce mortgage debt currently. That's the current law, right? And so there was a move to allow them to do what they we call what they call cram down, which is reduce the debt to the market value so that people are no longer underwater and stuck, essentially, as you said. And economists, I've talked to several economists now, and they universally agree that this debt overhang is a huge is a huge part of what's holding back demand in the economy. It's a huge part of what's killing our economy right now. They almost universally agree, even even to the even to the right, where you have economists like Reinhardt and Rogoff, who are on the on the right wing, have suggested that we need some kind of mortgage restructuring, or our economy is going to continue to be held back for years and years as we work through this debt overhang. Um, and so one of the ideas to do it, one of the ideas to deal with it was to just do, do it through the bankruptcy courts who are already set up to do it, who can do it on a case by case basis, um, that that mechanism already exists. And, and people, uh, members of our movement are also interested in changes with the student loan um, uh, exempt I, there's a there's a student loans can't be discharged unless there's a hardship and the hardship is essentially impossible to meet right. um so we have a couple of issues with the bankruptcy um courts but you know so the obama administration originally had this program called hamp which basically went which was a mortgage restructuring program that basically went nowhere they didn't they didn't do this um they didn't do this cram down, which would have made, I think, a huge difference. And now it sounds like they've recently released, I guess they're calling it HARP 2, which is a mortgage restructuring uh, program. Do you have, do you know much about that program and whether it looks like it'll be effective? I think I've heard both. Well, I, let me go back and then I'll answer that sure, just to sure. say about the bankruptcy changes. Um, it, it, you know, I, I raise these bankruptcy changes, and you and you explain them well. That you know, people can go into bank re, bankruptcy court and and restructure and cram down a mortgage on a boat, right. um, on a second home, uh, even on a second mortgage, but they can't do it on their primary mortgage. So it's it, this would have been a change in the back, bankruptcy law that made a whole lot of sense. There's already a framework in bankruptcy court to cram down um, loans. Right. Um, and it, it, it would have made such a fundamental difference because it would have provided a mechanism for people who owed far more than their home's worth, who were just stuck, who were just stuck in a, in a trap to go into bankruptcy court and get a fresh start. And this was a huge policy issue. Um, and and it, it, it's important to raise because this really could have changed this clogged uh, housing market that we have now. The banks, again, you know, within months after getting bailed out by the U U.S. taxpayers, went to work lobbying hard against this reform and killed it. Um, and again, it's an example, once again, an example of the banks, in, in, instead of using this bailout moment to get the banks on the same track with the public, with the, you know, the public interest with the American people, they turned around and killed a really critical policy reform. And the administration deserves blame because they didn't push hard for it. As soon as the banks barked, they backed off of it. So they introduced what um, you mentioned, this HAMP program that they put in place to restructure mortgages, to modify mortgages. And it had some good elements, but the problem is it was, it's voluntary. Um, and we've seen through the years that leaving things, you know, it's like leaving the fox in charge of the hen house, not to use too many cliches here, but, right. um, you know, when, when voluntary measures relying on the banks for voluntary measures is not going to uh, get the job done. 
Right. Um, and this and this bankruptcy restructuring that was supposed to be part of the plan, so that if the banks didn't voluntarily restructure mortgages, on the other end there was a risk of that homeowner filing for bankruptcy, and it was kind of the stick that would right. keep the banks in line and complying with this program. Once you pulled that piece out, the HAM program has been, uh, you know, I don't want to say a disaster because uh, many people have gotten help, but it, it not nearly enough. And right. it's been, just, uh, you know, riddled with with problems, and and all, and and many of these problems stem from the the, the servicers not complying with the program. They're just not complying on a very widespread basis, um, and, and and so we're really stuck. And so the administration just introduced a new program. What you mentioned, this HARP program, is HARP two, I and mean, all these acronyms. But right. Uh, you know, the gist of it is to is to help people who uh, um, are underwater to refinance. The problem is it's not going to help people who are uh, who are in foreclosure or deep in default. Um, whether it helps you know anyone remains to be seen. There, you know, it does have some improvements over the earlier program, but these are really you know sort of half measures. We need some really really fundamental changes, uh, and there needs to be a really systematic way to to write down housing debt to the value of the property. And you're right, even right-wing economists are, are, are pushing this notion. It's pretty obvious. Um, but there's been a lot of, a lot of resistance from the, uh, from the banks, from the industry. Right. Right. So, um, okay. And, and we, we have to wrap up pretty quick, but, um, so, so one thing that you think would be immensely helpful is to have some kind of bankruptcy cram down. Um, and with respect to the things that we were discussing earlier, various people have suggested um, things that can be done uh, to reform the financial industry. Um, I think Matt Taibbi listed five things that he thought would be helpful. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Um, yeah. And then uh, um, Mike Consul has also suggested things that he actually put them um, – in terms of demands that our uh, movement could make, although the demands, we, we don't like to use the demands word anymore, but just in terms of brainstorming these types of issues. Um, I think the one I recently heard Matt Taibbi discuss that he thought the one thing that no matter who you talk to, the people you know that he talks to that are concerned with Wall Street, the abuses of Wall Street, that everybody thinks that you should separate the um, investment from the commercial um, to, you know, break up the banks to remedy this too big to fail um, situation. That that's the one thing he thought, you know, was a was a real would have been a really big first step that didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I, that that's really fundamental. Um, you know, we've been talking about sort of foreclosure and mortgage issues, and that that's a huge piece. But that's only one piece. We're talking about you know huge themes of wealth inequality here, um, and and um, you know of, of, of bank accountability. And uh, you know in the in the late '90s, um, the, the Glass-Steagall was a depression era law that set set up a firewall between commercial banks and investment banks. And this right. was really critical in keeping commercial banks honest, keeping commercial banks serving uh, the the economy. Um, you know, there were still problems. They were redlining uh, communities of color. You know, it wasn't this perfect system, but, but it, it, there were protections against really systemic failure. Um, and, and it was really the Clinton administration, um, officials in the Clinton administration that were behind blowing up uh, Glass-Steagall. And in the late 90s, Citigroup um, wanted, or at the time, um, Citicor, they were called, wanted to merge with Travelers, this huge insurance company. And in order to do so, they needed to literally blow up Glass-Steagall. Uh, and so working with insiders in the Clinton administration, including Robert Rubin, who later became a very high paid executive at Citi and who came from Goldman, um, and Larry Summers, who became Obama's chief economic advisor, um, they, they worked very hard to blow up Glass-Steagall. And, and Citigroup basically wrote the law, Graham Leach Bliley, that blew this up. And so that's a really, really fundamental thing because that really, once that firewall was down, these, they, you know, that's what allowed these mortgage problems to spread throughout the whole economy. It created enormous systemic failure, um, and it was, you know, it's obviously been a disaster. And so that's a really fundamental thing: is we need to bring back Glass-Steagall. I mean, there's some big issues here. You know, we need, yeah. we need 
revenue reform. We need to t tax the wealthy. There needs to be a progressive tax system in this country, and we're going in the wrong direction. Um, and then, you know, as far as holding financial institutions accountable, I mean, there, there's, there, you know, again, we need Glass-Steagall. We need a transactions tax um, to raise money from Wall Street trading for revenue and also to prevent all this, the, these scams with these high-speed trades. Um, you know, we, we need a, a, a number of really fundamental reforms, a real fundamental um, policing of the derivatives market, which we didn't really get in the Dodd-Frank law. Um, and so there are some really big things that we need here. And, and, and you know, the banks need to be held accountable. Um, you know, people need to go to jail. There needs to be some level of accountability um, and restructuring of the status quo or we're going to be back in the same place. Well, you know, Wall Street executives are still earning huge money. They're still getting, uh, you know, they're still getting bonuses based on short-term gains. There needs to be a restructuring of the way that, that Wall Street executives are paid. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of very tangible reforms that we need. Um, and I guess as we're wrapping up, I mean, one really good thing about the Occupy Wall Street movement is it's really changed the conversation. You know, we were we spent the summer hearing nothing of you know deficit reduction, deficit reduction, deficit reduction, and it was painful. It was it was hard to pick up the newspaper because you just knew that this you know this did not get at the fundamental problems in the world or in the economy. And in fact, it was taking us exactly in the wrong place. Um, and um, and 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 Occupy Wall Street, I, I I think has really changed that conversation, and people are talking about income inequality. And you know this 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 is bank accountability, and this is a whole range of issues, um, and, and that's a really important starting point for the conversation. And if we can get the public focused on in income inequality and about structural inequalities, then we can move this country to a better place. Um, and so, hopefully, a seed has been planted there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that um, you know the one issue maybe we haven't touched on or we've touched on it but hasn't been explicitly mentioned is you know our movements feeling that uh, the political process you know is really been captured by these big money interests and that even though you know I I've talked to several economists now I've talked to people like you who are on the ground dealing with these things who are warning about these things and the sense I get almost over and over is that you know we have this litany of things that we think could we I think that we know how to fix things it's th that we can that we cannot politically get these things to happen because our political process has been captured by these banking interests and so you know things mortgage cram down which we know makes sense didn't happen and we don't we don't think it's going to happen because banking interests are lobbying and it's just not going to happen and so that's the other Piece. I think I think almost maybe the most universal thing I hear is, you know, the idea that we need to, you know, you'll hear it in terms of getting money out of politics, but I think even more fundamentally is making our political system, doing, you know, reforming our political system so that it's responsive to all of the people and not just the 1%. I think that the 99%, 1%, slogan um, is with respect not just to income inequality but also with res but also with respect to a notion that the one percent has captured our political system and that our political system is now working only on behalf of the one percent yeah I mean I think that's right and and uh, you know citizens you the citizens United decision which you know the Supreme Court decision last year which basically said that corporations are people and um, and they can inject as much money as they want into politics. Um, really, you know, took us backwards in a huge way. That was a that was one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in modern times. And 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 it, it's absolutely true that we're not going to get fundamental change uh, in the system, in the political or economic system, until we find a way to 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 reduce corporate domination of our political system. That's no easy thing. We need some really fundamental reform in the way money is injected into politics. We, you know, we're, we're very far away now in this country from, from a true democracy. Um, corporations are, are really dominate the discourse and um, how, to, how to get that back uh, or how to get there, maybe we've never had it, but how to get there 
um, is the question. And, and again, you know, Occupy Wall Street is a good start because you need to change the dialogue before you get anywhere. And you need to get people thinking about the, 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 the inequities in our society and the way that we're dominated now by, by corporate interests and how that's in, 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 in nobody's interest and not in, in public interest in any way. And as you shift that dialogue and get build political pressure to push back against against Citizens United, against this whole notion that, uh, that corporations really set public policy in this country. So there's no easy answer there, but, um, but, but changing the discourse is key. I saw, um, I can't remember where I read this, it was in a blog or, or someone interviewed, but they said that, um, uh, you know, that, that politicians should be like NASCAR drivers, so that they should wear pictures of their sponsors all over. <laughs> so right. maybe that would be a good start. Right. But the, have City and Chase and wear the stickers all over. Right, um, yeah, they, I mean, you know, yeah, I was, I was going back and, you know, there was a, there was a change to the bankruptcy laws um, several years before um, the housing bubble burst that was really kind of, you know, I imagine was pushed by the banking industry who at that point recognized that they had you know, books full of bad debt and were realizing that they were going to be dealing with bankruptcies and, you know, wanted to make those rules even stricter. Um, and when you go back and look at those votes, you know, it, it really crosses party lines. And so many of those, um, you know, those changes that really decimated the middle class that put corporations in control and these are piecemeal changes that happened over 35 years and there's a lot of them um mm -hmm. were bipartisan and happened you know like you mentioned rubens who was clinton's uh treasury secretary uh larry summers who served exclusively as far as i know in democratic administrations um you know these things these, you know, it's both parties that have really been captured, particularly, it seems, by banking and Wall Street interests. Like, you know, there's there's been a particular relationship between the Democratic Party and Wall Street and banking interests that you don't see with, say, kind of corporate polluters, you know, other types of money interests that that doesn't necessarily cross party lines in the way there really was. I, guess, I don't know if it started with Clinton. It seems like it certainly accelerated with Clinton, this marriage of the Democratic Party and Wall Street. And Obama, I think, is set to get a lot of Wall Street money again and, you know, has still an administration with Tim Geithner and, you know, previously Larry Summers and, you know, all kinds of Wall Street interests um, throughout his administration so it's very I mean I think that that's why this movement didn't feel like you know what what kind of demands could we make to this political system what does anybody think is possible is there any legislation that anybody thinks could realistically happen that would do anything to to really stem this tide I don't think anybody feels that it can I mean and I, I'm talking when you talk to mainstream economists <laughs> right yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that this is, uh, you know, this capitulation to, to, to Wall Street is, is bipartisan. In fact, that, you know, the, the bankruptcy, you know, quote unquote reform that you're referring to that was pushed through by Joe Biden because he represented Delaware and that was a big credit card state. Oh. And that really dramatically reduced the number of working families that could file for bankruptcy to get a, a to, to restart. And despite the fact that the the, the big banks were making you know huge money off off their their credit card business so yeah I mean it, it, it has been bipartisan it you know it's not to say that we're not you know far worse off with the with the Republicans but right. in, in order to, to hold our political system our politicians accountable we, we can't let one party off the hook and we have to recognize that a lot of the problems uh, rest in the Democratic Party as well, in both parties, and 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 this pushback is not just against one party; it has to be against the whole system, because it's fundamental. You know, the system is fundamentally broken, um, and is is fixed uh, by the big corporations and against the public, and that has to change. Now, it's a tall order. It is. It really is a tall order. I mean, people, you know, what are your demands? As if we know how to fix this. Uh, you know, as if we're masters of the universe, as somewhat Alexa O'Brien, who I just interviewed, said, you know, assuming that we somehow know to fix this. We don't. We know it's a huge mess. Um, 
that we that really has to change if we're going to you know have a democracy and if we're going to be able to you know have a middle class and have the kind of country that we've had in the past that we want to have again um, be able to deal with environmental issues that I mean we're on the brink of environmental catastrophe I think um, so it's pressing at this point I think it is critical and so I have a lot of hopes in this movement and I know a lot of the people that I've talked to like you who've been you know Doug Henwood and almost everybody I've talked to actually has said you know we've been saying this stuff for decades and, you know, we really felt like we were alone. And now all of a sudden, it's part of the conversation. And that's a huge feat in and, in and of itself. And I hope, but I, but I hope that it changes into something concrete, um, that something, that something transformative. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, I think that, you know, we could, certainly the movement could lay out a lot of specific demands, but, the, but there are much larger issues at hand here and, and you know again the, the fundamental one is really changing the dialogue and, and connecting the dots for people so we have sort of a shared realization by the majority of people in this country that are are, are disadvantaged by the system that uh, you know that the system doesn't work for them and, and, if, and if those dots can be connected on a big scale and that's one of the I think the exciting things about this movement then you know that, that's really a first step towards change. Yeah. yeah. So where are you located? Uh, we're located in in, uh, in New York City in Manhattan in Chinatown. Okay. Um, and uh, we you know we work with groups all over New York City and around the state. Um, okay. But our, our website is uh, www.needapp.org and there's a lot of information there both for self-help for people who are in trouble but also about how to link up to a larger movement. Great. I you know this all started I got in touch with you because Doug Henwood said that he wants to see the Occupy movement in South Jamaica, Queens, <laughs> because, you know, in some of these neighborhoods, and, and you mentioned another Brooklyn neighborhood that he mentioned as well, and I'm sorry, I'm not a New Yorker. Oh, Bed-Stuy, Bed maybe. Bedford-Stuyvesant? Yes, yes, Bedford-Stuy. Um, and I mentioned to him that there is an, a, 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 I don't know if it's a group, I don't know what to call it, but there is... A movement within our movement called Occupy the Hood and I know that the founder of that movement is out of Brooklyn and so I do intend to try to hook him up with you because I told Doug Henwood that I would and um, maybe so he can get some information to get to the people that he interacts with that are in those very hard-hit communities and I think it's important you know it's and and are they and I mean, what is the status of it? I mean, are there just still foreclosures? Are they really in trouble? What's the status in those neighborhoods? Yeah, I mean, I should say, although we're located in Manhattan, we work in a bunch of neighborhoods around the around the city. Oh, great. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know the, the same neighborhoods that were hit uh, hard by high cost abusive loans are now being hit really hard by foreclosures. Um, the number of 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 uh, defaults, you know, people falling behind on their loans uh, is going up and up. And, um, you know, again, it's, 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 it's in New York City communities of color that are getting particularly uh, hard hit. Um, and yeah, and, and it, it is really critical to build a movement there. I mean, communities are really being devastated by, by foreclosures. And, you know, and it's not just homeowners, it's also renters that get displaced. Uh, when properties go into foreclosures, because a lot of these are, are you know, are, are two or three family homes, um, and so it's really uprooting a lot of people. Um, and in you know, in Jamaica, there's a lot of uh, abandoned homes, uh, and it's you know, it, it's a, it's affecting neighborhoods, and it's it's uh, um, you know, people definitely are starting to band together and need to continue to do so. And it's you know, if this Occupy Wall Street movement is going to succeed, it has to spread or it has to continue to spread to you know, n not just in the center, central cities, but really out to neighborhoods that have, and communities that have been really hard hit by a lot of these abuses. Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, and even, you know, in small communities everywhere, there are people who can do, you know, the foreclosure crisis is really nationwide. Um, I know it's hit, it's hit, you know, the housing bubble areas, maybe the most, um, you know, on the coasts, 
were hit the most severe, but, you know, we have a lot of foreclosures in Montana. We have, you know, every community has a lot of foreclosures. And so, you know, I think it's, you know, like Mike Consul's written some about, you know, that the Occupy movement should hook up with these groups that have been working a lot on foreclosures. Um, and I think that it's a great idea. And I agree with you. I, I think the Occupy the, the Hood movement is a great idea. And my understanding is that it's really taken off. It's taken off in New York. It's taken off in um, New Orleans, Detroit, Boston. Um, that the Occup and, and it's great to see. I mean, you know, if we can get those areas organized and politically active, um, I think it's important. I think it's important that our movement do that, that it does spread out to those neighborhoods. So I will be Absolutely. trying to get the founder of Occupy the Hood, who I know is from Brooklyn, in contact with your organization, um, because I told Doug Henwood that I would. And it's very nice to meet you. And you guys are doing amazing work. Um, and we're really thankful to the people who have been doing this work for so many years just kind of laboring alone pretty much and hopefully hopefully you know we can finally I think have a class-based politics that hopefully organizes around some of these issues well let's hope so and thanks so much for doing this and for spreading the word and getting the word out um, you know about everything that's going on and hopefully we'll be in touch yeah and very good okay well thanks a lot thank we'll you talk to you soon all right, bye-bye.